Hello, I'm going to present the fourth paper of the TWINIT series, which is dedicated to ordered binary structures. It's a joint work with Hugo Gioconti, Patrice Osanda de Mendez, Pierre Simon, Stefan Tomasse, and Shimon Toronchik, and I'm Edouard Bonnet. So I want to convince you that if TWINIT is an interesting notion for graphs, it's somehow the notion for ordered graphs. Let's first define TWINIT. For that, we need to introduce trigraphs, which are like graphs with special edges that we will depict in red, and we'll perform contractions over trigraphs. We'll take two non-necessary adjacent vertices, in the case u and v, and make out of them a single vertex uv, and update the colors of the edges towards the neighborhood of u and v in the following way. So a vertex will be linked with a black edge to uv, if and only if it was linked to both u and v with a black edge. And all the other vertices in the union of the neighborhoods will be linked in red. So the rest of the graph, so what is induced by those vertices in the neighborhood and the rest of the graph does not change. So this was a single contraction. A contraction sequence is just to repeat this process until we reach a single vertex. So starting, for instance, from this graph, we can decide to contract vertex F and vertex E. We get this trigraph, and we continue contracting A and D, and so on and so forth. So you see that at any point, a black edge is now between well, two subsets, here the singleton C, and here the subset BEF of vertices. If there is a black edge between them, it means that there is a biclick between the two subsets. A non-edge means that there is absolutely no edge between the subsets, and a red edge means that there is at least one edge and at least one non-edge. Now to define twin weights, uh, we just say that it's the least integer d, such that the graph has a contraction sequence where all the trigraphs have maximum red degree at most d meaning that incident to a single vertex, they can be at most uh, d red edges. So I'm now in interested mostly in the overall maximum red degree. So I start with a graph, the red degree is here 0, and here I record that there is a vertex with red degree 2, and throughout the, the entire sequence uh, this does not exceed 2, so this contraction sequence witnesses the fact that the Twin weights of the original graph is at most two. In the first two papers of the series, we showed that many classes have bounded twin weights. It's the case of classes with bounded true weights, even bounded rank weights. Uh, any class excluding a fixed H or a fixed click as a minor, starting from any graph on n vertices and subdividing all its edges at least log n times you end up with a graph of bounded twin weights. And even some expanders, which are often considered as graphs without any structure, uh, while some classes of expanders have bounded twin weights. Despite that apparent generality, classes of bounded twin weights allow for an efficient algorithm for FML checking, where you're given a graph and a sentence, meaning a formula without free variables. So it's a first order sentence that is, it can only quantify over vertices, talk about the edge set of your graph, and then use the usual uh, Boolean connectors and equality. So this example of a sentence phi would encode the program kvert text cover, where you're looking for kvertices that together uh, hit all the edges of your graph. In this other example, you look for uh, an induced matching of size at least k, and this framework is not restricted to problems in NP, so you can play with alternations to express short generalized geography, which is higher up in the polynomial hierarchy. Before we exactly state the result related to the FOML checking algorithm, we'll take a brief detour to introduce a couple of notions from finite model theory that we'll need. So the first one is a first-order interpretation, which is a way to from existing relations to define new relations. So taking the example of 
uh, graph, simple graphs. So we have just one binary relation and we can redefine the edge set. So this first example would uh, flip the edges. So you would get the complements as the new graph that you build. And this second example, you would keep edges where they were and add a new edge between two vertices X and Y if they share a common neighbor. So that would have the effect of squaring your graph. An effort transduction is the same, except at the beginning, you start with adding a constant number of unary relations that are interpreted non-deterministically. So the colors come non-deterministically if you want to see th those unary relations as uh, coloring your vertices. And then this uh, new binary relation that is redefining the edge set can, of course, talk about the edges of the initial graph, but also about those unary relations. So that would produce uh, those edges. And then we would just um, take an induced subgraph and remove the colors. So every with interpretations, you produce one graph or one structure from one structure with an FO transduction. From one structure, you produce many structures. And you can extend both to classes by taking uh, all the images of graphs or structures in your class. A uh, striking fact of classes of bounded twin widths is that they are closed when you perform transduction. So if you take any class of bounded twin widths, and you apply any transduction, you end up with a class also of bounded twin widths, potentially with a higher bounds, but uh, this bound is function of the bound of your initial class plus the parameters in involved in the transduction. Now a class is set dependent. If from your class you cannot build all the graphs by taking an FO interpretation followed by taking new subgraphs, and it's monadically dependent. If there is no FO transduction, that would, from your class, give you all the graphs. On general graphs, uh, FML checking, the FML checking problem is believed not to be FPT. It's known to be AW star complete. And there's an intriguing and important conjecture that whenever there is a hope, whenever the class is dependent and morally does not capture for FML checking the complexity of all graphs, then an FPT algorithm is possible. If we're probably still far from resolving this conjecture, there are two very general classes where that are dependent and where we know a fixed parameter tractable FML checking algorithm, the so-called nowhere dense classes, and classes with bounded twin widths, provided we have a witness that the twin width is bounded in the form of a contraction sequence. For basically all the classes that we know have bounded twin widths, we also know an efficient algorithm producing contraction sequences, but in full generality, with just the premise that the twin width is bounded, we don't have this efficient uh, approximation of a contraction sequence. Another interesting aspect of classes of bounded twin widths is that they are small. It means that if you bijectively label the inverses of your graph with integers from 1 to n, and you now count the so-labeled graphs up to equality in your class, you'd get a number which is n factorial, accounting for this uh, labeling procedure, times something single exponential in the number of vertices. So this result was previously known for permutations or permutation graphs avoiding a fixed pattern. This is the Brex result by Marcus and Tardosh, which happens to be at the heart of the twin width theory. And it was also known for another class of bounded twin widths, which is uh, the class of graphs excluding a fixed minor. Due to the broadness of classes of bounded twin widths, it's tempting to conjecture that the converse could hold for hereditary classes. It turns out to be false. There are some hereditary small classes that have unbounded twin widths. If we recap all the questions that we saw so far, whether there is a good approximation for contraction sequences in general, this conjecture on all dependent classes admitting an FPT FML checking algorithm, and this refuted conjecture possibly linking small classes and classes of bounded twin widths. If you revisit those questions, 
when the universe, the set of vertices, is totally ordered. So now we'll deal with ordered graphs, ordered binary structures. And in the current paper, in Twin It's 4, we bring a positive answer to all three questions. It will be now convenient to revisit the contraction sequences that we're performing on graphs, now on adjacency matrices. So instead of taking two vertices, we're taking two rows or two columns, and we're merging them into one. So let's say we're removing the second, second column in that case, putting one and trees when both columns agree on one and three, zero and trees when they agree on zero and three, and some error symbol otherwise. Now the red degree is the maximum number of error symbols over rows and columns. Perhaps you dislike the fact that eventually we cannot contract the last row with the last column, so we end up with two vertices, so to speak, instead of one in the definition with graphs. So what we presented here is the bipartite setting. If you want to go back to the, the original definition of twin weights, you could force that uh, the contraction, say, of two columns is immediately followed by the symmetric contraction of the corresponding rows. But more importantly, we want to put a twist to that definition. So what we defined there was the twin weights of unordered ma matrices. The order of the columns and rows was irrelevant. Here we want to see matrices as intrinsically ordered. So what we'll do is when we contract two rows or two columns, we'll also put some error towards everything that was in between, all, in that case, all the columns that were in between the two contracted columns. And now the total error is the number of R symbols in a column plus the red degree. If you don't like and find this too clumsy, you can, above diagonal, uh, put different entries of zeros and ones. So this has the effect of introducing in the binary structure a uh, linear order. And now you can go back to the unordered definition of twin widths. It is equivalent to the ordered twin widths of the original matrix. We'll deal with matrix partitions, meaning a partition of the row sets, comma partition of the column sets, and also a particular kind of matrix partition that we call matrix division, where the row parts and the column parts of those two partitions there are supposed to be uh, intervals. There are consecutive sets of rows or columns. There is a partition viewpoint to twin widths. So starting from the finest partition where all rows and all columns are in singleton parts and successively merging two row parts or two column parts into one and putting in reds, putting in error, all the intersections of a row part and a column part, which are non-constants, you would now read the red degree as the maximum number of uh, those error zones uh, for a single row part or single column part. And uh, reaching the coarsest partition where all the rows are in one set, all the columns are in one set, uh, and trying to minimize this error value gets again an equivalent definition of twin Here it's the, the unordered setting. We are interested in this ordered setting, so either you encode the linear order as we saw previously, or you also count as an error all the parts that would be uh, in between the two parts that you merged. FML checking over matrices or graphs will not make a large difference, so just to fix something, we can take as the universe the sets of rows and columns, add a unary relation saying that something is a row as opposed to a column, put a total order on those row indices and column indices and finally have the uh, entry of the matrix in the form of a of a binary relation saying that something is a one entry so over a larger alphabet you would uh, have more than uh, one such binary relation maybe t if you want to encode t plus one values and uh, yeah the semantics would be as Imagined, and uh, when we'll say that a class of matrices is tractable, we, we mean that the FML checking can be solved in FPT time, so in some function of the sentence times something polynomial in the matrix size. 
Similarly, we can define a growth of matrix classes that we'll always consider to be closed undertaking submatrices. So a class will be small if the number of n by n matrices is single exponential. And we'll say that it's subfactorial if uh, it's basically uh, strictly less than n factorial. At long last, we can state our main result, which in the language of matrices reads as follows. For a class, it's equivalent to have bounded twin widths to be dependent, meaning that you cannot build all the matrices with an FO interpretation, or the same with FO transduction, uh, being monadically dependent. Have subfactorial growth, so growth which is strictly less than n factorial, or have growth which is single exponential, in that there will be a gap in between single exponential and n factorial, there is nothing. Be tractable, where uh, formula checking can be solved in FPD time. And you see appearing in red three technical conditions two bounded grid rank and rich divisions are notions based on divisions that we will define as we go, and pattern avoiding, which is a crucial notion here, which means not to contain one of six so-called permutation universal classes. What are those? The first class is the class of all permutations. So here we're using the convention that one entries are represented in black, zero entries in white, because our classes are supposed to be closed under uh, taking sub-matrices. Containing all permutations is equivalent to containing this universal permutation for, for every size, where you put uh, the permutation 1, root of n plus 1, 2 root of n plus 1, and so on, 2 root of n plus 2, 2 root of n plus 2, and so on. So this is the first class. The second is the same, where you would flip zero entries and uh, one entries. And then um, you would propagate from the permutations, you would propagate the one entries upward, downward, leftward, and rightward. So again, bounded twin weights is equivalent to not containing any of those classes fully. And this is our plan to show all these equivalences. Two crucial implications were already shown. One in twin weights 1, that bounded twin weights classes are monadically dependent. This is because FO transductions of classes of bounded twin weights have bounded twin weights, and in particular cannot be the class of all graphs. And in twin weights 2, it was shown that bounded twin weights classes are small. So what we will do is to follow the contrapositive of this path here, so let me remove the implications that are already known. Thus, we want to go from unbounded twin weights to permutation universal, taking those two intermediate steps. Once we are there, permutation universal, those three implications are fairly direct. The fact that we encode all permutations mean that our growth is factorial, and ordered permutations are known to uh, be independent. They can by means of an FO interpretations, express all graphs, and in particular, you cannot hope to, to have a, an FO model checking, which is FPT. You see that there is a double arrow here. We will also need the reverse implication from large root division to unbounded twin units to be able to claim that from a class of bounded twin units, we can solve in FPT time the FO model checking and in uh, classes of graphs, not ordered graphs, uh, this is a missing uh, ingredient. We don't know how to approximate efficiently contraction sequences. Here, because of this equivalence, we'll show that we can approximate in FPT time contraction sequences. So we don't need the witness, we can compute it. And from just a class of bounded units, we can solve uh, FML checking in FPT time. In the language of ordered graphs, our results read almost the same. Instead of having six minimal families of matrices, we have 25 minimal families of ordered graphs, 24 of which are based on those six families of matrices, where in addition you specify what the sides of the matrices are inducing in the graph, either independent sets or clicks, that's the times uh, four, plus 
25th class, which is the class of all ordered permutation graphs. And all those 25 uh, classes have at least that many number of uh, n-vertex graphs, and this matches uh, precisely the bound announced by the conjecture of Balog, Polobash, and Morris. Let's get started. We want to show the equivalence of unbounded twin roots and having large rich divisions. So we first need to say what a rich division is. It's a division such that any time you take a part, that's a column part C, you cannot remove k row parts such that the number of distinct column vectors in what's left from C is uh, less than k. Large ridge divisions imply large twin roots. What is this? Well, let's fix a 2k times k plus 1 ridge division and assume for the sake of contradiction that there is a contraction sequence witnessing that the twin roots is at most k. Let's consider the first time that a part of the contraction sequence is intersecting three distinct parts of the ridge division. In the middle uh, part of the ridge division, there can only be at most k other column parts uh, living there because all those parts are in conflict, so count in the red degree of cj. But each such part, say cz, is intersecting the ridge division at at most 2k non-constant zones. Why? First, the row parts of the contraction sequence are intersecting at most two row parts of the ridge division, by definition of CJ being the first time that three parts of the ridge division are intersected. And secondly, CZ can make a non-constant zone with at most k row parts of the contraction sequence, hence 2k zones of the division, the ridge division D. Now removing those at most 2k row parts of the rich division D, we end up with at most k plus 1 distinct columns in C prime B, 1 per uh, column parts of the contraction sequence. Indeed, all those super uh, zones here are constant. For the converse, we greedily coarsen a division where every part contradicts this property of richness. Show that only uh, the existence of a large ridge division can stop this process. So here, assuming that there is no large di ridge division, this process will end up with the coarsest division. And similarly, uh, what we did in twin roots one, we build, we compute a contraction sequence from this uh, sequence of divisions. Therefore, the equivalence between having no large ridge division and having bounded twin roots implies some FP3 approximation of twin widths for ordered binary structures. So we have an FPT algorithm that, given a parameter k, either outputs a contraction sequence, witnessing that the twin width is at most some function of k, or uh, realizes that the twin width is strictly greater than k in the form of a 2k times k plus 1 rich division. So far, we've established this equivalence, but the FPT approximation algorithm also gives this implication that bounded twin widths implies an FPTF formula checking. In twin widths 1, there was just the FPT algorithm in general binary structures if we are given the contraction sequence, and now we saw that we can uh, efficiently approximate it. Let's make this second step in this chain of implications that large rich divisions imply large grid rank. The grid rank of matrix M is the largest nigger K such that M admits a k by k division with k row parts, k column parts, where every cell has rank at least k. Take a large ridge division and color in red zones with large rank, and in blue zones where in their column parts, uh, they contain a particular row vector for the first time. The Marcus Tardor theorem implies that there is a large coarsening of D, say D prime, where every cell of D prime contains a small cell uh, which is blue or red, and taking yet another coarsening d prime prime of appropriate size, we get that all the cells of d prime prime are of large rank, either because they contain already a, a red zone, or we use the property of blue zone that they contain a private uh, row vector to build 
a large number of row vectors implying large rank. From the large grid rank, from these large rank divisions, we get one of the six permutation universal families, mainly by applying Ramsey theorems. And we reach pattern avoiding where the rest is almost routine. Uh, as far as matrices are concerned, for ordered graphs, there is a bit more work to get the exact bounds. I will stop here. I thank you a lot for your attention. Goodbye.